Congrats, Isaiah. Congratulations, Stewart. Isaiah. Congrats, Isaiah. <laughs> so Man. he did that. See that? See you. You do know the story, right there. He wanted to go have a nice engagement. So and the NBA said you can't sit out anymore. So now he has he had to go fight this dude. And the dude's like, "Hey, I'm gonna punch you in the eye, but I'm gonna give you some money." And I gotta go get engaged here, so <laughs> I can play here, my yeah. lady, so I can do this. So I'm just gonna hit you in the face. Say something about my mama. I'm gonna hit you in the mouth. Episode 100. Woo. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 100. Keeping yeah. it 100 here at Cinco Squad. I am so hyped for this show. And we have a special show because it is Grandpa Jay's birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Grandpa Jay. Jay. Yeah. <laughs> He's actually turning 100 today. It's not episode 100. 100 is it his is. day. I've joined the Centurion Club. I'll let you guys in on my secrets. If you like and subscribe to our show, I'll send all of my youthful secrets straight to your DM. It's called that Bob Marley. <laughs> Is, now, now, Jay, is this uh, is this the year you finally reunite with Sister Jean? You know it. <laughs> That's his girl. That's Come his on, girl, man. That's my all time. That's like my notebook that was girl. A problem, I'm talking about her name and name. <laughs> what do you want? What do you want? I want Loyola Chicago to win the national championship. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> Yes, well, birthday. happy birthday, Grandpa Jay! Thanks, guys. Happy birthday! Hope you've had a great day, and what a what a way to celebrate your birthday on yes. episode 100 here! That's right, we hit the century mark here at Cinco Squad. We're super hyped, and uh, it's going to be a great show. We got a lot to talk about, but of course, we got to throw it over to Mikey Mike for what's on his mind. Take us away, Mike. All right, so if you can give a, a an apple in hockey terms an assist. Over to Trey Day this week. He pointed me in the direction of a fact that I needed to look a little deeper into to confirm, and I confirmed that it is, in fact, a thing. So, on June 24th, 1947, Jamie may remember this. Mm hmm. I know exactly boxing, where you're going. Boxing. <laughs> <laughs> you were in attendance. Boxing Hall of Famer Sugar Ray Robinson fought Jimmy Doyle in Cleveland to defend his welterweight title. The night before the fight, Robinson had a dream that he would kill Doyle in the fight and attempted to back out. The promoter called upon a priest who calmed Robinson down and blessed the bout. Robinson proceeded to knock Doyle down in the eighth round, but the bell saved Doyle from a knockout. However, Doyle's corner stopped the fight. He was stretchered out and died the next day at a Cleveland hospital. It turns out Doyle had been fighting as much as possible and had subsequently been told he could not fight in his home state of California due to past injuries, specifically concussions, to buy his mother a house. Following Doyle's death, Robinson collected money from his following fights and bought Doyle's mother the house himself. That's really cool. But it sucks she lost her son. Well, Doyle rules. Yeah. Not so yeah. much in this fight. <laughs> yeah, specifically the injury I read that that, that dude had probably never fought again. <laughs> Robinson? No, he fought a whole bunch of that. I think. No, a lot. I know. Yeah, I know. The specific the one of the craziest parts to me was specifically the injury the doctor said he Doyle died from was a detached membrane in his brain. Wow. Yeah. Shit. So he like it caused internal hemorrhaging. In his brain, yeah, that is funky, funky, funky. But yeah, well, that, so that, that's uh, that that brought the energy down. Let's go to the grandpa Jay. Yeah, so <laughs> Jay, pick it up a little bit, please. It was a God wild. Damn, I saw it. I was like, "Is this true?" <laughs> Mike's yeah, just like Mike, as he's reading that, he's getting more and more like, "What the fuck did I just do?" <laughs> <laughs> so, like, uh, okay, so. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so he died, and uh, uh, rest in peace to Odoyol. 
Beach. Jimmy Doyle, yes. Rest Beach, Jimmy Doyle. Jay, uh, pick up the energy a little bit here on your birthday, please. <laughs> yeah, you know, you got to come my way. Let's come right into your locks of the week, ladies and gentlemen. And let's just say last week made the wrong choices with the team to cover and the team to win. Tennessee blew a and out, but I took them on the money line. Iowa State struggled against West Virginia. I mean, uh, yes, West Virginia. And they scraped out a victory. So if I'd gone the other way, we would have had a winner because damn did Kentucky look good against Alabama scoring 58 and 59 points respectively in each half. Most points were scored all season. Thank you, Bama, for not showing up defensively at all. So this week, I am going to get a little bit saucy and spicy. Why? Well, it's my birthday. So we're going to put out a huge NBA Friday night parlay because I'm loving the predictability of the schedule on Friday night. So. Here we go. First and foremost, we got Cleveland and Detroit. That means a win for Cleveland. So what are we doing? We're probably putting Cleveland on the money line. That's going to be a huge, huge favorite right there. So we're not going to get that much. So what we got to do is we're going to combo that with four more games. Yes, we're going with a Cinco squad, big five parlay in the NBA on Friday night. Take Cleveland on the money line. Take Boston to win at home to win their 10th straight over the Dallas Mavericks, who, by the way, Trey just saw lose to his Cleveland Cavs on a wild game winner. Dying to hear about that experience. Take Golden State in Canada to beat the Toronto Raptors. Then the last two, and I know these are my favorite two because here's what's guaranteed to happen. New Orleans, Indiana. Give me those points, baby. Take the over in the Pacers, Pelicans games. Defense optional there. And then let's end the night with the Milwaukee Bucks, who all of a sudden look like they kind of have found a little bit of rhythm, winning in Chicago. So let's go through that one more time. Your big Cinco squad, big five NBA Friday night parlay. And I'm going to post that ticket. Sorry, I didn't post my ticket last week. We're going to post it this week. You're going to see how much you can win on a $25 bet. And I'm hoping that is my Christmas present to myself. In fact, we don't hope, we know. So Cleveland on the money line against Detroit. Take Boston Celtics on the money line. They're going to beat the Mavericks. Take the Golden State Warriors on the money line to beat the Toronto Raptors. Indiana Pacers going to New Orleans. Defense optional, take the points. Take the over in that game. And finally, the Bucks. This is the nightcap. They'll be in Chicago. They will beat their central foes handedly. In fact, I'm going to say take Milwaukee to cover. And that, ladies and gentlemen, if you go ahead, you're going to see what the 25 is going to win for me. I hope you go ahead and take that risk, too, because we got to win big money together. Those are your locks of the week. I'm calling it here. It's my birthday week. We ought to win this week, baby. Big NBA 5 parlay. Lock it down. Jay Billis hit it on the head when he spoke on College Game Day about the expansion of the NCAA tournament. It is stupid. It is dumb. And if you're really going to complain about it, go play D3. That's basically what he said. You have all the momentum in the world. You can go win your conference tournament and get in. I understand the mid-majors, we've had years where teams would be 30 and 4, and I've defended those teams. I've personally said those teams probably deserve to be in the tournament. They're going to be exciting to watch. But at the end of the day, if you don't win your conference tournament as a mid-major or lower, conference you're not going to get into the tournament just plain and simple expanding the tournament is for one thing and one thing only it's for the money they want to expand it because they see how much money it's generating every single week people are taking thursday to saturday off in the first weekend and even sometimes the next weekend i know i got four screens going at once all the time so it's all about the money i just wish the ncaa would come out and say this but please do not do not expand the tournament it is fine the way it is it's perfect 68 best teams right now and you know what if you're that concerned that's why we have the nit tournament it's not as good but you know what you get a chance to play for a championship so leave it alone the ncaa tournament is just a few weeks away and i am hearing a lot of noise by certain teams that are making good wins usf for example but what do these teams need to get in? I mean, their they're, they're resume's there. They're making a, a big splash. And I think it's a lot different than the college football playoff than it is right now. Mm-hmm. I think basketball's all about momentum. So, Grandpa Jay, I'm interested to hear what you have to say. What does a team starting now need to do to get in 
if you're not a top power five conference. All right. So if you're a team and you're on the bubble right now, you got to circle the game against your opponent who has the highest current RPI. Or if you're lucky enough to get a ranked team at home, you got to make that your Super Bowl. You have to go all in, focus, ready for that win. You got a late quad one potential win. If it's against a ranked opponent, that looks great on your late resume. What it does, it helps you build momentum going into your conference tournament. In the smaller conference tournaments, you know they only have one shot. So if we're talking mid-conference here, you probably have to make a run to the finals as a lower seed who wasn't expected to be in the tournament. And third, you definitely have to show up on day one of your tournament if you're on the bubble. You could not get eliminated and expect to get into the field if you're right on the bubble and you can at least win one, preferably two games in your conference tournament. So finish the season strong and don't cry if you thought you had a great resume to begin the year and then you fell to shit as the year ended. They're going off of what can you do for me now? How sexy do you look now? It doesn't matter that you beat Duke in November. Duke's rattled off 18 wins and you've rattled off six. So what have you done for me lately? Show the committee you're ready to play in March. Doesn't matter what you did in October or November or December. You know, and, and the biggest thing that stemmed this is I was watching the USF game on Sunday, and they basically the announcer said they still have a lot of work to do. Now, I'm going to read you a stat. USF has won 19 or 18 and 1 in their last 19 games and have won 12 in a row or 13 in a row. I'm sorry, 13 in a row. Now, I know they play in the American Conference. The American Conference has the likes of FAU, who they beat, Memphis, who they beat when they were ranked. So how how is it a team like that still on the bubble of getting into the tournament or still has a lot of work to do to get into the tournament? I just don't understand it because they're playing really good basketball, and that's what it takes. Mike should know more than anyone because two years ago, his team did not, in, in January, looked like shit. And I said that from the beginning. They did not look like a tournament team mm -hmm. at all. So – and then they go in, they get in the ACC tournament. I think they get to the final four of the ACC tournament. They end up going to the NCAA tournament, going to, and then all the way to the national championship game. Right. I just don't get why we're not looking at what's going on. I get the conference tournament is big, right? But if you lose like in the second round of that tournament, they hold these teams accountable, even if they have like a 30 and five record. Winning right. 30 games in the NCAA is very difficult nowadays because you have to take into consideration that a lot of these teams are a, a lot better than they than they used to be. These mid-majors are a lot better than they used to be. They can knock off the likes of Kansas, Kentucky, uh, Duke, UNC, all those schools. They can knock off those Blue Bloods mm -hmm. in the NCAA tournament, and they have. They've proven that over the last three or four years, we've seen a lot more Cinderella's upset. We've seen what? In the last 10 years, two, six, two 16 seeds win and move on. So – why are we not doing, you know, that, you know, I, I just don't understand. So honestly, I think it's it, it. Jay, I completely agree with, with what you said. You have to be playing your best ball going into and coming out of your conference tournament. And you've hopefully made a deep run. The problem is it almost seems like we've got this two pronged type of situation where mm. it is. What have you done for me lately? But it's also what was the perception of you coming into the season? And with a team like USF and, and some of these other teams, it's almost like they're waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like, we know you're going to be like, because we thought you weren't going to be that good coming into the season, we're waiting for you to show us who you really are. We're waiting for the evidence, no matter how deep, how good you've been throughout the year, how deep we are into the season. We're waiting for that one moment where you look like exactly what we thought you were going to be. And then we can point to that by not when we don't put you in. Like, I, I, hey, I don't, not, I don't, that's coming I for don't... them this weekend in particular, because they're going to Charlotte, which is a tough place to play. Charlotte's a completely different team at home. Yeah. USF barely beat them mm -hmm. at home. I think they won by less than a, a field goal. Maybe it was two points or, or by a field goal, two or three points. Mm -hmm. So USF needs to have this road win because they, they, they tout Charlotte as a tough team to beat. I don't. I mean, even Calipari said the other day, like, look, this is a big win for us here. Kentucky scrapes a win at Mississippi State. Mississippi State beat Auburn at home. I think they beat Tennessee at home. So, you know, you say, well, this team can do some special, you know, something special when they're at home. It's a big win, but it makes no sense for a ranked, you know, big blue blood team to say it's a big win. But you also have to take into account how good is that team this year? Like, right. Overall, you say, well, Kentucky should be Mississippi State all the time. But if Mississippi State has only lost two games at home and they're beating top 10 teams at home, 
then right. that's a good road win. It doesn't matter if you're a ranked opponent or not. So there's so many factors here compared to college football that I would never want to be on the committee because I don't see how you can come up with something subjective enough. It just it just clearly based you on you will keep a team out this wrong. I, I said this. I said this in the beginning of the year, and we can go back and look in one of the episodes. I said this is going to be the hardest year yep. for teams getting in or not. But not trade, it. Trade, but, trade it. What you yes, think? But how much sympathy with sixty-eight spots? How much sympathy <laughs> do I have to have for team sixty-nine and seventy? Every year, that's one of my most annoying things: is the who got snubbed, and it's the team that was seventy. And let's be real. I mean, maybe I could be wrong. We'll never know the answer. But was the 70th team really going to win the championship anyways? If you're that goddamn title in the bubble, were you going to win it anyways? USF would be all right. They got ranked now. They're 25. They'll be all right. They'll, They'll find be all right now, yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. not worried about that. That's just an announcer and one John's talking about with a bunch of hyperbole. That's just what announcers do. When I look at what you have to do, I agree with a lot what Jay said. Something I think that where college basketball should take the mentality on, that college football does, and I know it's less spices, don't be scared to blow people out. Because that one of your greatest thing your resume is kicking somebody. Else. Don't pull them off. Don't call the dogs out. If you're sitting there and you got a shot to go out there and beat the hell out your rival, you get up 15, keep the starters in. Blow them out. Because when we look back at the resume and they say, okay, this team has this strength of schedule, this team's won this many road games, and then one team's going to come up and say, but I also beat five teams in the top 25 by 20 points. Why yeah. am I not the number one or two seed in this tournament right yeah. now? If I can sit there and say I stuck with this team – and because somebody else pulled out, that's also on my resume. Because let's look at the whole totality. So to me, that's one of the biggest things I'm doing is I am not calling off my dogs, especially if I'm on a bubble. I don't give a damn. Like if I'm USF, we're talking about Charlotte, I don't give a damn if USF go up 20. Keep the damn stars in and run it up to 30. That's up to Charlotte to go make that stop. I also think that during the year, like when we're looking back in October and November, you're a completely different team. And we have to take in the transfer portal and the newcomers to the team as as a factor right right it's you're playing your first game with this entire team in october november it's gonna take some months that's why college basketball is a 35 40 game season Mm -hmm. because it's gonna take some time for these guys to get some gelling and like i said back when uh usf played florida state at the orange bowl classic they they there were some missing pieces that i was like okay they can improve here they can improve here they look like a well-oiled machine. So if they ever got snubbed, it would be like a very bad thing. And that's what I'm saying. Like a lot of these teams that I'm looking at that win 30 games, a lot of people say, oh yeah, they're part of this, part of the MAC conference. And they don't, they shouldn't get it. It's like, yeah, but you could say, okay, yeah, they didn't play the likes in Kentucky and everything, but you know, 30 wins in college basketball is pretty freaking hard. I'm sorry. Yeah. Just, yeah. But to be that consistent. Point- you're a very well coached team if you go in that many games in the year. It doesn't matter your conference. Right. I mean, from a committee standpoint, I do think, just like in college football, we do devalue the wins at the beginning of the year and the loss at the beginning of the year. We always look at who's trending hot. I mean, it's yeah. what you call – I guess I like to call it UConn special. How many times have we seen UConn just suddenly get hot at the end of the season? Next thing we know, we're looking at UConn in the Final Four, and we're like, damn, that team wasn't – I mean, remember the Kimball Walker? Last year. How many times have we Last seen Last year. It? Last, last year, year even. last year, same thing, right? They're terrible. <laughs> like in next thing we know, we're watching this team just start house team because it is what you're doing at the end of the year. So that's the other thing. What am I doing towards the tournament? Is what right. everybody up here just said. When I get to the tournament, don't lose in the first round. Don't lose in the second round. You need to be playing your best basketball going in because at the same time, if you're not playing best basketball going in, why would I put you in the tournament? If you're trending down, knowing right. I'm just saying you have to get your ass kicked anyway. So they're always going to go to the teams that are trending upwards. Well, they normally back in the day when the ACC was the id conference, they'd try and squeeze in that ninth and tenth team because the, obviously the, the the fans travel well or it worked out well to have that team as a potential high seed in the region because mm-hmm. of geolocation. So there's some politics there that we know are going to get still get played. You can't ever really at fault, you know, put them at fault for that. They're not going to put so, someone totally undeserving. But we know every year there's going to be three to four teams that are sitting there saying, why the heck not us? Because they ran their conference, they got to their conference finals, and they lost their team who's 17 and 14, yet they're sitting there 28 and 3, and then they don't want to let them in because they're playing in the Horizon League or something, right? So yeah. I'm with you. Like You have to be able to know how to play great basketball. It doesn't matter your conference. If you're stringing together 12, 13, 14 wins in a row, I mean, that to me right says right that you can win a lot of games in a row. Your team knows how to be disciplined night in and night out and refocus and refocus 
doesn't matter the conference. I mean, doesn't matter the opponent. You still have to prepare to win. So uh, I, I I would hate to see that happen this year. I think the mid major. It's going to happen a lot. It's going to happen a lot more this year. There's a oh, lot. Yeah. Of teams, there's a lot of. If you go through the standings in the on ESPN mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. the college basketball, you'll see a lot of teams that are double digit wins and yep. single digit losses. Mm -hmm. There's going to be not three or four. There's probably going to be ten teams mm -hmm. that should get in that are not. And there's just not mm -hmm. enough room, and that's why the whole yeah. expansion thing was a thing. I'm sorry, but. It's like it's like twofold for me, right? Like I I think a thirty win team should be recognized. You do a good job, but I also see it as we shouldn't expand the NCAA tournament as well. Right. So, well, I guess let us know what you guys think in the comments, and we'll uh, we'll hope for, for a good NCAA tournament here in a couple weeks. March Madness, come on, baby! Shout out to the real fathers out there. Now, I'm going to talk about two fathers real quick. We got on one end LeBron James, and we got on the other end LeVar Ball. See, some people wanted to go at LeVar Ball all crazy and say, man, I can't believe he's going out here and going this hard for his son. To be honest with you, LeBron was one of the people that called him out at a quick point, and then he started to actually do the same thing. Now, LeBron, that's my guy, but at the same time, you did put a certain amount of pressure on Bronny, and LeBron himself, he admittedly said uh, that years ago, one of the biggest mistakes he felt was naming LeBron Junior, aka Bronny, after himself because it was adding pressure. So when you do that, them it just ain't fair, Bron. But at the same time, who else I want to call out is a lot of y'all adults. See, people out here taking victory laps, saying, "Oh, Bronny's not going to go to the draft. Bronny may not make it." It's a fucking kid. What do y'all actually benefit from him not being successful? I get y'all like his father, but it doesn't have any reason to root against this kid's downfall in any case. And that's why I'm looking at some of y'all adults with shame because if somebody was to do it to your child, you would still say, "Hey." I get what I'm doing. You may not mess with me, but this has nothing to do with my child. And I just don't appreciate that at times. And at the same time, I'm still going to start LeVar Ball out, and I'm still going to shout out LeBron because they're still both good fathers. They still have the best interest of their kids. They want their kids to be good. Clint, y'all out here parenting, y'all put pressure on y'all kids every day to pass a math test. These people, they want their kids to do the best, and at least they are actually fathers that are present. Uh, many people in America, we can say, are not present and are not doing right for their children, and these two gentlemen simply are trying the best they can, even though at times they do come up short. The NBA has seen a lot of fights in the past week, and I don't know if it's WWE or NBA that I'm watching, but it seems to be like that in all sports. Hockey is being more like that. That's natural. Right, but we see more in NFL. We see it on the on the field, on the court, anywhere. Right, so it sparks some interest. Should these players get suspended for fighting in the game? Trey Day, what's your thoughts? To be honest with you, unless it's a very, very egregious, and I mean very egregious, I'm talking malice in the palace. And honestly, I think they got overpunished because some of that shit, a lot of that shit, was on the fans. But unless it's very egregious, I'm not really for this suspension. You got these people out here, they're, they're high testosterone, the juices are flowing. Let these people fight and let them keep going. Why is it okay for them to do the hockey, but then as soon as it gets to basketball, it's like, oh, let's go suspend these people. Everybody wants to talk about how the NBA is soft and people don't get in like they used to. You know why? Because if I hit somebody, I may get suspended for 35 games. Quick fact. Remember a show weeks ago, I talked about one of my favorite NBA fights. It was Dr. J fighting Larry Bird. Would you know that those two in that game, they fought, came back into the game, didn't get suspended, and got fined $7,500, got to keep playing. If those are the type of consequences, why wouldn't people just nut up and go actually punch people if they feel like they throw an elbow? But people are scared to, you know, get fined a ridiculous amount and get suspended. So don't complain about the fight, but then complain about everybody soft and flopping. This is an encouraged behavior that Adam Silver said, or not Adam Silver, I'm sorry, RIP David Stern said, Back when he wanted to start going crazy with the suspensions, you know, first it was change the clothes. Then it was, you know, take the corn rolls up, pull your pants up, stop fighting. He wanted to go out there and take that mentality out, and now we're here. Jay, how uh, are you feeling well, about that? Well, one thing on yours, I mean, come on, let's be honest. The NBA doesn't really have fights. They just have dancing around in a circle for about halfway through the court. And then, basically, it's one guy pushing one guy, and then the guy's like, no, but but you gotta remember. My thing is, it did used to be fights until people started getting suspended for that shit. Remember, yeah. if you get off the bench, you get suspended for one game for leaving the bench. So now, if I actually do hit you, then what? Now I am suspended something crazy. Look how quickly they were just throwing our test out of everything. I mean, Draymond, Draymond, he wants to go play with people's balls and shit. And you know, that's what everyone's gonna play with people's balls. And honestly, that should be a, a, that should be more of a suspension. He's hitting men in the balls. You are a man. You know what it feels like down there. That is way more grievous than you punching a dude in the face and then punching you back to me. 
Yeah, I was just, I was just saying, because like any time, like the fight with the Pendlekins and the Heat, I was watching. I was like, man, I wish that I, I was like, throw, a, throw a fist, like do something. And then all the Heat players got suspended, and I'm like, damn, like they didn't. Even, if you're Imagine gonna get, Jimmy if you're gonna, if you're gonna get suspended, and I, I want to see some fist thrown. I want to see, I want to see you, like just basically just going at it, like hockey players do. I don't want to see you running around the court after you push someone. And it's like, wait, what are you doing, dude? I know that one dude from Detroit. He deserved to get suspended. Who Isaiah Stewart? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, that that yeah. that's a little. I uh, didn't see the film. Did y'all see the film? I did. It, I was right there. I was like Isaiah, man, what the hell are you doing? He's like, I wanted to hit him. I was like, damn, bro, come on, bro. <laughs> no, I didn't see the film on that because, to be honest with you, if it was that bad, where the fuck was homeboy's teammates at? Maybe they weren't in this defense. I didn't see any of them tap up the next day talking about it was crazy. Maybe he did deserve to get punched. I'll be honest with you. Sometimes motherfuckers deserve to be punched. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they deserve to be punched, but I mean, come on. Like, once you're off the court, you're off the court. You're done. Like, come on. No, that, that, no, no, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. No, yes. if, I, if, no, if I say something offensive right now to your mother and we leave the court, you going to punch me? You're going to say, we off the court. Remember, Kevin Garnett once told talked about Lala about Carmelo. He chased him down. That was his wife. Should he have not followed him or should he have followed him? You can talk about yeah. it off the court, you know, you want to. I know you, John. You're not going to let somebody go talk about your wife and then walk up the court and say, well, it's all oh, no. the no. no. It's all right. So you don't know yeah, what happened exactly. Isaiah Stewart. So until yeah. somebody tells you what happened, I can't say Isaiah Stewart didn't, wasn't, shouldn't have been allowed to punch him. Yeah, I, I hear you now. I hear on, you. A, on a side note, two facts about Isaiah Stewart. A, he's from Rochester. And B, he got engaged. So congrats, Isaiah Congratulations, Stewart. Isaiah. Congratulations, Isaiah. Congrats, <laughs> Isaiah. So he did that. See that? See you. You do know the story, right there. He wanted to go have a nice engagement. So and the NBA said you can't sit out anymore. So now he has he had to go fight this dude. And the dude's like, "Hey, I'm gonna punch you in the eye, but I'm gonna give you some money. And I gotta go get engaged here, so <laughs> I can really punch my lady. So I can do this. So I'm just gonna hit you in the face. Say something about my mama. I'm gonna hit you in the mouth. Jay, what do you think? <laughs> I, I'm I'm kind of a. I, I'm kind of at odds with it because I understand what the NBA or other associations are trying to do, which is they're trying to make sure that these guys understand it's a game. And I don't, they want to portray it that like it's anything more than a game. But that's their livelihood, right? And for a lot of guys, too, it's it's more than just their livelihood. It's their sense of belonging and purpose. Like, you don't have anything other than the sport. And you find a lot of times when guys are that deep in and and they kind of play the game for a lot more than just where in this game as a livelihood, like they, they put their all into it. You're going to find they're playing in a different intensity. You see that they're playing with a different energy. And I don't see why they should get punished for exactly what you're asking for is for them to bring their passion and love to the game, to the court. And that's what fans are paying for. They're not paying for them to just freaking run X's and O's. You want to see motion. You want to see passion. Like I said in my rant, like you have to let people even be a little bit excessive with a celebration. Why punish people for showing emotion? So on one end, I'm like, yeah, let them scuff for a bit. Problem with that scuff for a bit is if the wrong people start jumping in, like an older coach or somebody that may get hit that shouldn't isn't supposed to get hit, it might lead to repercussions that nobody wanted, right? Person Stay steps on in the wrong field. Then. The Yankees manager, <laughs> when Pedro hit that motherfucker, he shouldn't have been on the field. Wait, well, he he no, yeah, he, that, he that's right. But it's different. It's different if it's coming towards one bench because Guided that tends him. to happen, right? Like it can happen in front of a bench. So now everybody's clearing that bench right, because Pete. obviously they're trying to be in defense of players, and then wrong person gets hit. So I understand where the the negative side of it comes into play as well. So I'm kind of stuck in the middle here, where of course a part of me is like, no, let him scuff for a bit, but the other part is like, well, what might that lead to? And then. Is that going to leak into, let's say, the AAU culture? Because now it's the norm in basketball. Is it going to leak yeah. into high school baseball if all of a sudden, like, every time someone flips a bat, fucking first baseman just lays a freaking forearm in his face coming around first base? You know what I mean? Like, uh, how, oh, yeah. how does it leak down to the youth? Yeah, and but- is that the example that you want to have? We get hockey's hockey, but if we're saying these guys are the example for the sport and it's okay at that level, why are we going to punish youths to say, no, 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 you have to wait till you're a pro to fight? But no, here's, here's my thing, Jay, right? Like, so yeah. when, when we're looking at sports, and I think the biggest thing is we try to – we're sitting back, and I know we all play competitive sports at a high level, and we all try to, you know, have those juices flowing. Mm-hmm. I did a lot of things on the ice. I did a lot of things on the field I'm not proud of, you know, that I, I'm like, okay, looking back. But in the moment that I'm – juices are flowing, stuff like that, yeah, maybe, like, you know, I'm not thinking like that. I'm I'm hyped up. And I get so irritated when 
there was some some something happened recently. I forget what. I mean, maybe one of you guys can let me remind me. It was something where they like basically torched the guy for doing the. Uh, I can't remember the act. I can't. I, it's just on the tip of my head talking. I just can't think of it. But when a lot of people sit back and they're like, oh, that guy should be suspended. He's terrible. Blah blah blah. I can't believe he did that. It's like, all right. Well, let's take it back a little bit. I mean, he's playing a very high competitive rate, um, and we're they're playing the sport that they love. And I'm, honestly, that's their job. That's their job is to play sports. So if someone tries to take their knee out or tries to do something, which they do a lot, we don't. You don't see it from a thirty thousand foot lens. But there are guys like that are in hockey slew footing, which you're dragging the guy's foot from behind when the rest are skating up to play, there were guys in the lineman in the pile that are sitting there punching ribs yep. doing, you wouldn't imagine what happens underneath that pile. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't, you think these guys are all cool. They are all cool, but they're battling right there. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and the same with NBA, you don't know what happens when the guys are coming around. I mean, now cameras are everywhere, but I don't know. They're the, I'm not condoning fighting, but I do hear you on this sense of saying it does. Sometimes an NBA game, like the heat Pelicans, in February, not very exciting game, and all of a sudden the crowd was into it the entire game after. The entire rest of the game, it was like someone lit a fire under the crowd's ass. It's like it was it was intense crowd. So, But isn't that the thing? People keep saying that everybody want to complain about the All-Star game is not competitive. We want these guys to play hard. Yeah. That's a part of playing hard is being willing and ready to go out here and possibly bang because you want it so badly at that point that maybe you are ready to fight. But I am interested, though, Mike, our resident wrestling expert, our fight yeah. expert over there. How do you feel about this? So I think this is very, in the from the NBA perspective, this is very on brand for what they are now. I mean, if you're not going to, if you're going to call every ticky-tack foul in the world, oh, then you're going <laughs> to, then I'm not going to be surprised when you suspend people for pushing and shoving. It's it's a line it's drawing a line where it is that you suspend and i think the line's a little too far back right now we're pushing and shoving doesn't really warrant suspensions i mean again mal like like pointed out mal of the palace is the number one example of if guys haul off and start like hitting fans and, and shit like that okay now now we need to get into suspension talk if they're just you know if they're beating shit out of each other like that's not what what we're here for you're here to play basketball you're not here strictly to fight but you got to give these guys a little bit of a leash a little bit of leeway here and i think jay to your point i we do want we do want these guys to be good role models for the up and coming players but i also think that we need to stop blaming them for every bad thing that happens with young athletes good point this is just this is just unfortunately this is the culture in general Yes, you can, you know, not having guys just come into blows all the time. That's that's important to try to curb some of the things that are going on. But that's what I'm saying, Mike, is like, I also bring it back to the youth coaches as well. Like, right. You have right. to reel in your you have to reel in your team. I mean, Jamie. You see a swim fight. I don't know if that happens. I mean, if you see the swim fight. Actually, I had two too. little boys tonight that I was told yeah. by another coach to kick them out because they ended up putting hands on each other where one is grabbing the other one and then the other one pushed. And they told them, look, guys, you can't you can't put your hands on each other. Like, we know that was one of the rules when you came in. Right. Problem with putting hands on each other in the pool is you hold someone under and now it's a big life. Well, that's a different. Yeah. You know I mean, it's a different example. Yeah. I don't yeah. think, I think when you get into a fight on the court, it's once it's done, it's done. There's no right. carryover, but everyone wants to. And I'm sorry, I just remember it. the Travis Kelsey situation in the Super Bowl. I, th- I figured that's that what does not warrant about. every like, oh, he should just be fine, should be suspended. No, Kicked you're up. in heat of moment. You make a dumb mistake. It happens when we're all we're like like Trey said, testosterone running through. I don't think suspension should be. Because once it's done, it's done. But that's right? all, that wasn't a fight. That was just a violent outburst. No, it wasn't a fight. But we still were going yeah. off yeah. about that. <laughs> they were saying Travis Kelsey should be kicked out of the league. He's not a Hall of Famer anymore. He is. He he should be benched for the rest of the game. We were talking like, about for Taylor Swift. Oh my god! It was all yeah, it, ridiculous. It, bro. it just it stems back to the this idealist point of view that like this is how it's supposed to be, but it's not supposed to be a certain way. That's why I said I'm. I'm I take right. both sides of this where I can see like 
you're not supposed to be like the way we love sports because it's unpredictable. So we have to look at the landscape of it and stop saying that there has to be a predictability of it because emotions run high, especially late in the season or mm -hmm. in rivalries. Like yesterday, Texas Tech was being blown out at home against Texas. One of the Texas players is going for a ball completely hip checks the kid from Texas Tech intentionally. And, uh, you know, they have to go to the monitors to check if it's like, that's the kind of shit also to like, just get to my blood boy. And I was like, as a ref, like you saw the intention. Why did, why do you they have, have to go to, they have to, go to right? the monitors? It's so, no it's matter so what. It, and it just makes no sense anymore because then they can't I even express the emotion of the play. But the only thing it does is it de-escalates anything that may happen if it's a play like that, right? So it takes right. away from a potential brawl or it calms the energy down. It still kills the flow right. of the gamers, so I hate it. But going back to the point about the, you know allowing these players to, uh, to, to give their 100% in that moment, you're right. hoping that it's not always the poor reaction of, I'm going to kick those, that, you know, that, that dude's legs out for what he just did to me. He set a hard screen on me. I'm going to deadly come back for him. I don't think other than Grayson Allen, there's people who foul stupidly continuously throughout a game. We knew the crap he did at Duke. So, you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's a concern too much in the NBA. Yeah, Draymond's had his time, and we know he does probably more man, than anybody else. Kobe ran, through, man, Kobe ran through his own fucking teammate in the Olympics, of man. Course. Come on now. Come on, yeah. guys. Like, he ran through Paul. He sent Paul into the stands. And so, that was not, like, that was that's shit. different. No, like, it wasn't it, it's, the same, it's, it's exactly what you were saying about the Texas yeah. Tech situation. Yep. The guy hit the dude. Okay, it was. He gets. This, he gets. And they were talking about it today. Okay, he got ejected. That's enough. He gets yep. ejected from the game. That is the suspension. That enough. was the suspension right there. Right. Yep. Done. Right. He can't play this Once game. Once you get so. ejected from the game, that was you're done. Season. You lost Even the if game. you don't get ejected, I don't think it warrants all these suspensions all the time. I get you're trying to make it a clean game, but at the end of the day, I think. Suspending a play, it just it's a situation by situation basis. But I think yeah. we're suspending guys way, way too much on ticky tack things, Correct. especially in the NBA where there's barely any fist throw. <laughs> so are y'all seeing Grace Allen with that haircut and that face? He deserves to fucking be punched. <laughs> I, Trey, well, I, know I, the I I don't. Like? I was just gonna say, Trey. I don't think I've ever agreed with anything you said ever more than I do right now when you say that. <laughs> Well, you heard it from Mike. He doesn't ever agree with Trey. So moving on, <laughs> let's let us know in the comments if you think <laughs> Gary Bettman got asked what he would say to anxious Winnipeg Jets fans about the fact that they're afraid that they're gonna lose their team. And his response was, get over your anxiety and come to games. Really, Gary? That's the approach you're gonna take. You're gonna tell them to get over themselves and just to come to games. I understand what your idea was because you want them to come to games, buy tickets, concessions, all that to save the team, make more money. And that's not the wrong idea, but maybe a little more tact would help them come to games. Instead of being a dickhead and showing up to their city and going, oh, just get over yourselves and come to the games. There's nothing better to get over your own anxiety than to come to games. Yes, that's right. Being cramped into an arena and cheering on your team can be fun, but when they're already dealing with anxiety, I don't know if that's going to help. So if you really give a shit about Winnipeg Jets hockey and keeping them since you've already taken away their team once before, if you really care, Gary, maybe treat them with a little bit of respect instead of making it feel like they're the problem. Go! <laughs> <laughs> and yes we're taking it to miami we're going to miami and we're going to talk about mr messi in miami and how he is one of the largest soccer names in the world yet mls is still struggling to kind of break through that barrier so I'm gonna throw it down to grandpa jay see what he thinks about his beloved sport of soccer, not getting any love. Well, well, you have to know the athlete. And Messi has been a very quiet superstar for most of his career. He likes to go under the radar. And because Spanish is his first language, he's refusing to do interviews in English. And I agree with him because he doesn't want to look incompetent in a way, right? Like he can't really talk the language. So he's not trying to have people downplay his ability to do anything. He's trying to remain in his comfort zone. And so he'll only do interviews in Spanish. So I guess maybe that might be part of the reason why maybe the United States uh, professional or, or soccer association, whatever, the, the U.S. men's national team, women's national mm -hmm. team, 
to help promote the sport. Maybe that's one reason why, because they need they need him to connect speaking English or doing interviews in English. But have a translator. I mean, we're at that point already. You could put subtitulos on the bottom of the screen for all I care. I yeah. get him to come out more to events that you're promoting as an extravaganza for your sport. Like Messi should be the face. It sounds weird, but he should be the face that the U.S. Soccer Association or whoever they are, I'll get the right name. That's who they should be using right now to promote that game. Every little kid wants a piece of it. We saw it when he first came to Miami. People were going nuts. We saw celebrities at the game. Obviously, he caught their attention. Yeah. They, they, All of a sudden, it's like, what's going on with Messi is to talk over things that are happening in bigger, supposedly bigger sports arenas because his namesake is that big. Problem right now with the MLS is there's too much to compete with. Like The MLS can't compete with college basketball. They can't compete with the NBA. They're not competing with hockey right now. So you keep taking a back seat to where it's like, well, you know, is this the back back page of the paper if you're going to put it somewhere in there? So they're having a tough time headlining Messi, and I could see why, because English not being a strong suit, he's not really at the forefront, not even as a spokesperson uh, 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 for certain brands. You, know, you don't see him on many commercials. He's on one Super Bowl commercial. So you don't even see him in the public limelight. It's like he's even his private life. And he's one of the biggest superstars the game has ever seen, just kind of going on the radar in Miami, and it's nuts. Like, How could that be happening? It, it, it's, it's like a double-edged sword, ultimately. You want the best player in your country on your in your professional league, but you also want him to kind of be – a guy that's outgoing. Like, it would have been better if he had, like, Neymar, right? Neymar mm -hmm. coming over. Or mm -hmm. Ronaldo, even. Like, Ronaldo was a guy that was more out in the public, out on, you know, social media, more that way. So, um, you know, I don't know much about soccer, but I know down here in Miami, you know, there's guys on the corner, you know, selling jerseys out of their car. So, the hype is here in Miami, but it died down real quick. It was the first game. It was like, oh, messy, 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 messy. And now it's like... Like there's yeah. there's not as much hype, but uh, b about it now. Granted, Inter Miami, I think it plays up north in like Sunrise area, which is still far. Uh, I think it's like a forty minute drive from me. But <laughs> um, when I'm looking at like Messi, I think yeah, I agree with you. He there's got to be some more help because Messi's handling the South here, but there's got to be more help. And like I remember, LA Galaxy had David Beckham. And, you know, getting those big superstars to come here and buy into the brand of MLS is going to help. But the problem is the money's too good overseas. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you agree, Jay? Yeah, I mean. The, the, the money's way too good. I mean, we're not right now, the Saudi league alone. The Saudi, the Saudi league is throwing out these insane contracts for players to sign like two, three year deals. Like the live deals for like 300 mil, 400 yeah. mil. And it's like, what the hell are you thinking? But for them, it's like, look, we just need big names over here in our market because we need our league to be as significant as possible, and, and they print money. So, yeah, they'll never be able to compete from that standpoint. But everybody wants to have a little piece of the slice of the pie and come maybe experience life in America and see what it's like to live in America. So they do have that going for them where later on, they say more in the twilight years, it's kind of what Pele did. They, you know, you got these superstars coming over to say, I'll end my, end my career in the USA because – it, like I said, it does well from a standpoint of sponsorship, from identifying right. with a brand, from being on American soil. So you can have those companies now possibly help promote your sport more. But that's why I go back to my argument. It's like, why isn't the MLS or, you know, the, the U.S. National Soccer Association, why are they not taking advantage of this right now is my biggest concern with a World Cup coming up where, of course, it doesn't matter. Once you host the World Cup, everybody wants to come but you're trying to promote the sport in your country. So what you're doing by hosting the World Cup here and you're sharing with Mexico and Canada having this North America right. World Cup is trying to increase it really increase the quality of the brand of soccer here in North America. And just mm -hmm. bringing the players here alone that are better players isn't going to do that. Jay, I need you to correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't Argentina mm -hmm. win the last World Cup? That's correct. Yeah, so you have the best player in the world who is on the reigning World Cup champion, and you are mm -hmm. hosting the World Cup. You mm -hmm. need to do more. like it, it, And you're running out of time to do it if you want mm -hmm. people to really get invested in the World Cup being in North America. I know from what I've heard, because I agree with you, John, that they're, it's going to help. It would help to have other people, other top stars, come over and play in other regions. Supposedly, the next expected big signing is Ronaldo. 
Mm. He's only on, I believe, a one or two year deal in the Saudi league. He's going to get his major money. And then he's probably they unless oh, yeah, he's probably coming over <laughs> here and he's probably going to LAFC. Yeah, he's an LA guy for sure. He he'll be an LA guy. And at this point, LAFC is the higher profile club mm. over LA Galaxy. LA Galaxy is more like the is more of the they used to be really good with Landon Donovan and David Beckham. And with yeah. those all black uniforms, he'll look like the villain. Exi- so if they exactly. pit him the villain so and Messi the hero in his pink uniform, say, it'll be great. I was gonna say, you don't a lot of Ameri- good Americans, like good American players, go overseas and play yeah, for teams. Yeah, they go overseas. Yeah, they'll go to Europe. So that's that's where you're losing the battle. It's not yeah. the players, the good players. You're losing the battle in your own country by losing the players to other right. other countries. Like, well, you have to. Hone in but on it's, your... not, it's not bad for the national team because you want to play in the Premier League or you want to play in the Italian Serie A, you want to play in La Liga because if they're playing against better competition all the time, then and they're being coached by incredible a, a manager who knows the game who can win championships. That's what you're bringing back to your national team, right? Someone I guess that's the, the bad part. Of the national team that doesn't help the MLS in a lot of ways. Yeah, no. it doesn't, it doesn't help, help the national team. But what yeah. you know, good is that do if your best players still aren't here. I mean, it, it's no different than we just talked about this. You look at the WNBA and how some of these players were like, okay, I'm going over to Europe to play because the money's over there. So if the marketing isn't right and it just hasn't been right, then we're in a bad position. I mean, ultimately, I look at, you know, Miami, let's keep it real. We talked about this even back with the Heat. Miami is a fun city at parties, but it is a fair weather. Exactly. It's a fair weather city. L.A. is to an extent, but at least you're going to have the Hollywood backdrop there, which is why I would have said it had been better for him to have went to L.A. Because the other day I'm reading a story, and it's about uh, Messi coming out with one of the Kardashians' kids and walking out of the stadium, and everybody was, like, talking about that. And I was seeing this on, like, People Magazine, all these places. It's like, okay, that's the type of marketing that you need. If not, does somebody need to go to New York? Because the thing about New York is when they fall in love with New York, they fall in love. They're hardcore fans. I don't care whether it ends up being the Rangers being good, whether the Yankees are good, if the Mets show up and be good once every 60 years, if the Jets be good once every eight generations, whatever happens out there, <laughs> they're going to support. I mean, look how the Jets had this whole thing. They need to go to the <laughs> yeah, and the Aaron yeah. Rodgers shows up and the Jets are suddenly just the lead block. Right now, it doesn't matter what Messi does. Messi can go out there and put up 10 goals, and it's still not going to be the first four stories on Sports Center. Mm-hmm. The other thing I do admin mean, agree with Jay is the English thing. It's not his fault. I get it. I probably wouldn't want to be put in that position either. But if not, they're going to have to get a translator because we got to sell the personality. If you can't sell the personality, it is hard to sell the sport. That's one of baseball's biggest issues when you start to get an influx of superstars and they couldn't speak English. I remember watching the home run derby, and I think, what was the guy? Uh, Cess was, uh, I can't, Jonas Cess. Jonas, Jonas Cess. 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 I remember yeah. that was a big moment, and the moment yeah. died because he couldn't do the interview. No, he couldn't. But, but, but to your point right there, Trey, the biggest name in baseball right now, his, the next biggest person, like the biggest mo- person in baseball right now is Shohei Otani. Mm-hmm. The next biggest person next to him is his translator. He's more in the yeah. news than he's more in the news than Shohei. So yeah. it can be done. But you but see, I do. he also did with Shohei and the boy Shohei do going forward. He went to the LA Dodgers. That's why the LAFC thing is a key of somebody going there because at this point the Galaxy is the Angels. And yeah, you can blow a big, but you're not gonna be like being on the Dodgers. You're not gonna be, yeah. And and and, and the biggest thing that I see is that I to your point is that these soccer players have to go to a sports town, right? Mm-hmm. Go to Philadelphia, go to New York, go yep. to, like, these Chicago, go to these sports towns. You go to Miami, Seattle, Atlanta, Atlanta, Seattle right? I don't know yeah, all the teams, huge. right? So, yeah. I mean, you know, Miami is not a sports town. It's just not. They buy into them sometimes. Like, I remember, I always say this, like, I remember the one time in the grocery store, dude was like, Panthers suck. Panthers. I was like, they just won the President's Trophy. Mm-hmm. He's like, what's that? I'm like, the best record in the NHL. So, it's like... Yeah. They don't know about their teams until they're, they're in the only news. judging them off. Have you won a championship? Have you won? Have you won? Okay. No, but they've been there, right? All those, all the Miami teams have been in a championship right. Right. recently. Con- con- yes. con- <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. Except the Dolphins, and the Dolphins have been competitive until the end of the year, right? So, right. I just feel like you know Messi just needs to get out in the public more, but also get a translator because like people love that translator, like. They were talking about how the Dodgers are like it, it comes with he, he has to come with a translator. Like Shohei made his translator come there, but it, it might be a pride thing too, right? So you never know. Get you. And here we go again, where the sport of swimming 
has officials that absolutely know how to just turn something great into something absolutely bitter. So Owen Lloyd, who is a senior at NC State, who is one of the hardest workers in America because the kid's a distance swimmer. And if you don't know swimming, that means he's swimming anywhere in the region of about four to seven miles per practice on average. And he's doing eight to 10 of those a week. Raced his way to victory at the ACC Conference Championships in the 1650 freestyle. That's the mile. But the victory was given to his teammate, Ross Dant, because Owen decided to celebrate while the race was still going on. And as he climbed up on the lane ropes, he fell over into his teammate's lane who had also finished the race. Well, the problem with that is in the rules, it states that it's a disqualification because he interfered with another swimmer, even though he was done swimming the race. So what I loved about the post race was his teammate, Ross Dant, went up on the mic right away and said, I think this is the dumbest rule in swimming. Owen beat me fair and square. This is not my gold medal. It's his. Well, we knew a couple of days later as Owen will take to social media and Owen actually posted something pretty insightful after, of course, slamming the officials with a meme post. He then added to that post. And I love this for all athletes. And I'll make sure I quote him properly here. Don't stop celebrating. Embrace your emotions and let them flow. Sports are beautiful. The hard work, dedication, and commitment that goes into a single meet game match race is oftentimes hidden. Swimming is no different, and yet it is one of the only sports where we are sometimes told to bottle this up and not show how much a moment means to someone. If we want this sport, that meaning swimming, to, so, to grow, so much to us to grow and expand beyond the limitations that are placed on it, we should not inhibit these feelings. Let swimming be fun. Way to go, Owen Lloyd. Way to call out these old heads. Way to call out people that keep saying this is how it's always been. It's time to free athletes up in our sport. If you do something great, you should be allowed the opportunity to celebrate. How are you interfering with a swimmer who's already finished the race? Let's stop the bullshit. It's time to make swimming fun. It's time to stay up with the times. Be gone with these stupid rules that have nothing to do with interference of making another athlete or interfering with their outcome. This is the dumbest rule for sure in swimming. And Owen Lloyd, in my eyes, you're a champion and you're a champion for going to social media and telling every athlete, let's fight for our rights to celebrate our hard work so some dumb idiot on the sidelines doesn't go to a rule book to take that away from us. Way to go, Owen. Let's get it right, swimming. All right, since it's show 100, we got to keep it 100 by playing a little game, a jersey game, in any sport, anywhere. All right, Grandpa Jay, take us away uh, with the numbers. He's going to read them off, and we're going to all try to get them uh, okay, guys, spit out numbers. I, I might spit go random the orders there, so don't think it's going to be in order, but we will start with zero. DeAndre Two. Swift. Four. Brett Four. Four. One. Penny Hardaway. Three. Alan Iverson. Six. Bill Russell. Bill Russell. Seven. Michael Vick. This is a tie. Ten. Tim Hardaway. Nine. Hardaway. Nick Van Axel. Eight. Kobe Bryant. Yep. Thirteen. Dan Marino. Alex Rodriguez. Twelve. Oh. Tom Brady. Oh. Fifteen. Carmelo Vince Carter. Sixteen. Joe Montana. Nineteen. Joe <laughs> Montana. Steve Yazerman. You can't Joe do Montana. doubles. Can't do doubles. <laughs> Why can't I? Eighteen. Gracias. <laughs> he didn't wear a number. Hey, man. Seventeen. <laughs> Jake DeLonge. You say who? Jake DeLonge. Jake DeLonge. I said Philip Rivers. Was that Rivers seventeen? He was yeah, I thought he was 18. 20. That was Peyton Manning. Barry Sanders. Of his many numbers. 21. Ooh. Deion Sanders. 23. LeBron James. James. Jason Giambi. <laughs> what a winner chicken dinner. 22. <laughs> Emerson Clemens. Kobe Bryant. 25. Tino. Barry Jason Bonds. Giambi in New York. Oh, he couldn't call the same one twice. Like. 26. 
Le'Veon Bell, Le'Veon Jonathan Bell. Sawyer, twenty-seven, DJ Lemayhew, <laughs> John Carlos, twenty-nine. Eric Dickerson, thirty. Terrell Davis. Now I'm going to name double numbers only. Thirty-three. Patrick Ewing, forty-four. Say Larry Bird. Dirty Dick, fifty-five. Uh, Brandon Graham, sixty-six. Alan Fanica, seventy-seven. Another line. 88. <laughs> Do we have an 88? Um, Mike Orvin. Oh, I was going to oh, say CD Lamb, but okay. Aaron Donald. Aaron Jones. Oh, Wayne thank Gretzky. you, Mikey, <laughs> with, the, with the confused face. 60. Didn't say 61. <laughs> Probably the toughest number, right? Uh. Just John Michael Schmitz <laughs> ah, yeah, so And on that note, that, ladies and gentlemen, is keep it 100. Call out your jersey number. We didn't keep tabs, but these boys definitely know their jerseys. As you can see clearly, I like balloons. They like jerseys. <laughs> we got to end episode 100 with Stump the Squad. Of course, it's our signature. We got to bring it home. And then this starts our brand new Stump the Squad, our single squad 100. The episode champion is Grandpa Jay on his birthday. So congrats to Grandpa Jay. We do not have your belt slash whatever yet. We will have that soon. I don't be bored. We hate it. <laughs> but we're not the villain. But yeah, hate let's, it. let's throw it over to Grandpa Jay to for Stump the oh, Squad. I I did, 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 play a hater ball because they got hater raid going around. On this show right now against yours truly, the winner of our first round of Stump the Squad. So we're just having pure fun Ooh. here tonight. If you guys want to play along, negative two if you get it wrong, plus two if you get it right. Whoever has the most points gets the dub for the week. And I would like John to take us away this week because I have a feeling he has something that is going to stump us all. Because these days yeah. he's been asking some good questions. To stump us all. So, stump us all. which NBA ring is the most expensive? And biggest. Is it the Toronto Raptors? <laughs> da- D- Dallas Mavericks? Cleveland Cavaliers? Or the Golden State Warriors first ring? I'm going to go Cavs. Trey goes Cavs. For some reason, in the back of my head, I almost feel like I heard that it was the Raptors one. So I'm going to go with the Raptors. Mike says Raptors. Yeah, you know, given that they probably will never win another one, I think they went all out. And I know that Golden State's third one was much bigger than their first one. I don't think it's Cleveland. <clears throat> and the last one was? Dallas. Who? Cool. Hmm. When Mark they beat Cuban. the Heat. Mark the Cuban. 2011 one? I'll take the Dallas Mavericks. Big ring for Dirk. All right, Big so heat. today I have successfully stumped. Grandpa Jay and Trey Day it is the Toronto Raptors. Yay, back of my head memories. Intuition knew it. I said it. They aren't <laughs> going to win anymore. They're going to go all out. And then Kawhi left, and he's going to get a statue and his number retired. Never. All right, Mike, take it away. With okay. What, so take it over to college basketball. Which of the following teams who made the NCAA tournament without a winning record is the only one to not to be a number 16 seed. Is it the 1995 FIU? 2014 Cal Poly? 2004 Florida A&M? Or 1985 Penn? Which one of those is not a 16 seed? Which one of, which one of those is the only one to have made the NCAA tournament without a winning record and wasn't a 16 seed? A&M. Flor- John says 2004, Florida A&M. I'm going Who was the 2014 team? 2014, well, that would be Cal Poly. Yes, please. Okay, so John wants Florida A&M. Jamie wants Cal Poly. Trey, you said 1985 Penn? Yes. This week, I have successfully stumped John and Jamie. Mm. 1985 Penn. They were 15. 
I don't know who Jamie is. We got Grandpa Jay. But... Grandpa Jay, I'm sorry. Jay, you got it right. <laughs> <laughs> He's, I didn't stump Grandpa Jay, so you got it right now. <laughs> Wait, I thought right. I got it right. <laughs> no, you did. You did. Oh, what were you, you saying? Because he's not. Because because I said Jamie. Because I am not yeah. him. Well, you know what? This is the one. This is the one day per year that I won't refer to him as Grandpa Jay. Oh, further away how old he is. That's some birthday love right there. Yeah, well, fellow swimmer, I got nah, you. Screw it, Grandpa Jay. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. So in tip in typical stuff the squad fashion, we got to cool off the winner. So Trey. Okay, so combine's coming up. You know, mm-hmm. big money's coming up, free agency, NFL. So currently, Ohio State currently has the second highest total money being made on an NFL roster. So Ohio State, like players, mm-hmm. have the second most money being made on an NFL roster. Of these Big Ten teams, and I'm talking Big Ten futures, meaning Big Ten coming up, of these Big Ten teams, who has the second most money currently on NFL rosters right now? Wisconsin, USC, Penn State, or Michigan? Oh, shit. Because we're saying futures. Mm-hmm. Penn State. When I say futures, I'm saying because USC was in the question, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because so counting you, next year. Yeah. Penn State. And you're counting, the, and you're counting them as – Okay, I'm so. counting them as a current Big Ten team based on whose contracts are on what team at this moment before free agency starts and we reset the market. Who's the biggest? Mm. I'm going to say Wisconsin, you said? Wisconsin, USC, Penn State, Michigan. Wisconsin. Yeah, John's going I Wisconsin? Think it, I think it's Wisconsin. Mike's going Wisconsin? Bastard. I thought of that before you said it. Don't worry. Penn State. And Jay's going Penn State. Okay, so today I have successfully stumped Jay. The answer is Wisconsin. It's because of Russ, isn't it? It's oh, Russ it's and TJ. TJ, TJ and Watt. Russ. Oh, I forgot Russ, TJ remember, Russ there. is still under contract at his moment. So yeah. Russ is the boost with TJ. The order actually is Wisconsin, USC, Penn State. Iowa actually has more money on the roster right now than Michigan does. Yeah, Michigan doesn't have a lot of Michigan doesn't have that much. The tight ends are Iowa and a couple guards in the yeah, yeah, we, and then Aiden Hutchins is still on his rookie contract, which is right, not that much. Paid, he hasn't yeah. gotten paid yet, yeah. so he won't yeah, get he paid. Gone, he will. Hunter Mill and then Ben State with bump up. Yeah. yeah. All right, Jay. Wait, what's so the scores? So, 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 so the scores are Mike at four, John and Trey at zero, Grandpa Jay is eliminated at minus six. <laughs> we already started off. Get the fuck out of here! Get the fuck out of here! We're ending this cycle. That's yeah, how we right here. here. I'm back next week. And well, we, two, well, we got. What so, we gotta do is just get him on. real tired, real tired. Every exactly. Week. Jay, Let's end this speak. one on a celebration of an in celebration of our hundredth show. Can you guys name? And this does not include quarterbacks. How many players in NFL history have scored a hundred touchdowns? Is it twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-seven, or twenty-nine? Mm, what numbers? 24, 25, 27, or 29 players who have scored 100 touchdowns in NFL history. And we know the only one to score 200 is Jerry Rice. This is 27. 25. Damn. 24. 24 for Mike. 25 for Trey. 27 for John. And your winner is nobody because we have a tie. The answer is 25. Way to go, Trey Day. Looks like we have a tie between Trey Day and Mike. <laughs> Let's go. So here is my tiebreaker question for you guys. And it's it's a name here. It's not a number. So it might be a, it might even though a tiebreaker here is obviously going to be if you can actually guess the name on the spot, and if you can't, then we'll go to the number that that person is on. Which active player is next up to be on that list by next season? Julio Jones. Julio Jones. What are you doing? Are you doing best for best? For, we're supposed to do best for hundred. No, uh, hold on here. Jeff. Hold on here, Mike. You have a guess. Come on, he can't get all day. I didn't take all day of mine. I thought we were rapid firing. Come on. Come on, Mike. Go. Three, two, one. Yeah, I really one. thought we were rapid firing. That's why I said it so quickly. 
I thought it was the first person to get quickly. You're going to get it wrong. Three, two, one. I Mike can't think up. of another name other than Julio Jones. All right. The answer is Mike Evans. So can you tell me what number is he on right now for career touchdowns? 93. 97. I was smiling at prices right. Way to go, guys. It's 95. So we go back to the tiebreaker once again here because they have tied <laughs> once again. All right, I get you. Got a tiebreaker? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Give me one second. I'm pulling Nobody it Nobody wants to lose show 100. We're in triple overtime. <laughs> well, the first overtime was kind of. <laughs> Look at what time was to see if anybody could go exactly. All right. Manu, Manu Bowl had the most career blocks, had more career blocks than points. How many blocks did he have? Oh, that's a great question. Okay, Mike, go back to 2K. He looked at the records list. What was it? And you have 10 seconds to answer. 2,396. Wait, what? Very precise. 2,396? 2,396. Okay. 2,396. Let me get my calculator just in case. I'm going 2,123. I don't need my calculator. <laughs> All right, I'm going to take a guess because I think he All averaged right. four blocks a game and had a six-year career. And so if he was on a career average of almost four a game, play about 80 games, 3,200. Uh, three twenty times. Yeah, I think I think Mike acts a pretty good guess right there. I think he's about twenty four hundred and fifty, if not three thousand. So, so the answer is two thousand eighty six blocks, which makes trade day. Yes, Cinco yeah. Squad episode one hundred <laughs> first winner of this new challenge. So trade day, congratulations on your first win. The standings now are trade day at one. The rest of us at zero. It is 2086 again. That's right. Trey is Cinco Squad episode 100 winner, which means he starts off our new challenge at one and the rest of us at zero. So this is I'll how you don't hate on people. Congrats. <laughs> uh, class, happy birthday, class, Grandpa Jay. <laughs> well, heading into the weekend, Mike and I will begin our spring training tour here nice. in Florida, starting on the East Coast, working our way to the West Coast. Not hitting every stadium, but trying to hit every single team. Mm -hmm. um, it should be a fun time. So if you're in the Tampa, Fort Myers, Punta Gorda, Port Charlotte, West Palm Beach area, and you're going to these games, come say hi to us. we got some prizes to give away. We're going to do some questions. It's going to be a fun time. But any final thoughts, fellas, heading into the weekend? Let's go sports. I'm excited for this trip. I'm excited for some spring training baseball and go North Carolina. Yeah, these boys are going to be up in my area soon, so excited to welcome you guys here in a couple of days as well. We got them hogs coming to town. Let's take care of our Kansas, Kentucky. Let's go. Yes, sir. I'm wrapping in a suitcase. I'll be there, too. Nice. nice. Flying suitcase. Yeah. I'm flying coach. <laughs> flying I got you. I'll, coach swing, I'll swing through on yeah. my way down, Trey. In a coach yeah. suitcase. That's I'll I'm put getting. you in one of those dog crates. Yep. Because you got that dog in you. Got that dog. <laughs> oh, and real well, quick, before we go, Game changer, Cam Newton. That was not game managing. That man's a game changer. Y'all seen the performance. <laughs> the he wizard. Throwing, he was throwing the wizard of spring camps. <laughs> Don't mess with the doggy. What's the what's the saying? You mess with a fight or whatever. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you met you, you got it. yeah, it's not about the with, size of the, the dog in the fight, it's about the, the size of the fight in the dog. It was about the size of the dog. <laughs> Mess with the bull, you get the horns. <laughs> he was tossing that kid. Hook him. But thank you everyone for tuning in to all of our episodes, all of our wackiness, yes. all of our craziness. <laughs> we appreciate it. We got a we got a plethora of more episodes to come here. So looking forward to another hundred episodes. Yes, sir. And of course, bringing in more content on our socials. Make sure you tune into our socials, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and Facebook at Cinco Squad Pod 5 We'll see you guys here next week where we begin episode 101. So have a good weekend, guys. Talk. See you next week.